hi everybody welcome back to my channel i am back the cold is gone um i hopefully all traces of it is completely gone i feel a lot better uh, i've got all my energy back so we're gonna jump right into episode five of ancient america and in this episode they're really there so they're still in south america um, they're talking about, I, I actually skipped a couple chapters because it's, it's actually a lot, uh, them going into like full detail of what they discovered and found. Um, this is just a part of it. And then after this, I'm going to actually fast forward to the conclusion. If you want to read it on your own to really dive in deep to what they have, just check out the link in the bio, the link to this art, um, uh, this book is in the bio. And it's free. Um, so, what I, something I'd like for you to pay attention to is the the, the difference between what how, what they discovered in North America and what they discovered in South and Central America. It's fascinating. I know, like, not everybody's uh, right now. Currently, I'm studying. I'm actually studying the Bible because I felt like. You got to really know something before you talk on it. And I don't believe that you should just listen to your pastor and just take his word for it. I think you should actually seek knowledge on your own. So I have been seeking knowledge on my own and my way of doing it because I'm not a big, <laughs> sounds funny, but I'm not a big reader. <laughs> um, I have to do a lot of reading with school. Uh, I'm taking U.S. history and American literature and those two alone. And then I'm taking this math that I'm like adding letters and true and falses and things I really don't want to add is oh, finite math. That's what I'm taking. So everything I'm doing is a lot of reading with school. I don't feel like reading outside of school or to be quite honest with you. I just, sometimes I just need a break. Um, so with, uh, see now I've lost my train of thought. Anyway, <laughs> I hope you enjoy this. Um, what I was trying to say was my my assistant. What was I trying to say? You have an interview at eight. At eight. You know you ain't no help. That's what I'm, you, you I don't pay her. So at 10? <laughs> it's not at ten. It's at eleven. You're doing the, the Bible. You're horrible. You're, you're horrible. You're reviewing the Bible. Yeah, and and what else? I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you don't get paid, okay? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, I apologize. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm studying the Bible. Learn for yourself, and that's what it was. I remember now. Thank you, assistant. You're so, pay attention to the comparison they're going to compare it at the end but um what i've learned from studying the bible is they had said that they believed that the indigenous people in north america were coming from the tribe well coming from jeroboam jeroboam is a part of the tribe of judah so if you can uh, if you can you, you got the 12 tribes of israel uh, and in each tribe, there's different families, so it'd be like clans. And so you got the tribe is Judah, the clan, one of the clans is Jeroboam. Now, what I disagree with in the book is, and maybe, I mean, I haven't, this is why we're going through the whole book. And this is why I'm trying to, you know, really, uh, really go through it, tear it apart and understand everything that's being said in it. But, um, they claim that they believe that the North American or North Indigenous, uh, North America Indigenous people are um, from the tribe of, or from the clan of Jeroboam, right? From the family of Jeroboam. I disagree with that. And the reason why I disagree with that is because I'm looking at behavior and their behavior doesn't coincide with Jeroboam. Jeroboam in the Bible, they, he's, he was just, <laughs> really, really pissed God off, okay? 
And when I say really pissed, I mean really pissed God off to the point that God just kind of like, I want to say, turned his back on him. So I and that's not something I'm looking deeper into. Did God wipe them out, or did God just like, he's just not even following them. He just turned his eyes away from them in a way, you know. Um, meaning he's not even like they're not. You know, the Bible is about a, a royal family, so he may have he may have stopped following that family. Doesn't mean they're dead. Doesn't mean he wiped them off the face of the earth. He has basically, in a way, kind of cut them off. It does not cut off one of the tribes because they're not they're not a tribe. They were like a clan, right? They were a family. So Jeroboam, the behavior with Jeroboam is they insisted on worshiping idols. They just could not. They couldn't get enough of them. They're the ones that kept bringing up the golden calf and whatever else they can find to worship. And they literally, the King Jeroboam's little words were, um, here, I put two golden calves. He had placed two golden calves. And this is back when they were in, um, I don't know if they were in, I think they were in Judah. This is way back. This is way back. But anyway, you know, and when it comes to the location, I, I, I'm still studying more because I'm hearing people saying how in America's where they believe the Garden of Eden is, and I don't personally, I don't agree with it. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding back until I do my research on that. That's like a whole nother topic. But anyway, um, Jeroboam, the King Jeroboam, said that he told the people, "I put two golden calves there for you, for you to worship." The golden calf is the one who brought you out of Egypt. So can you imagine? Can you imagine <laughs> how angry that would make you? Just say, let's say you you help the old lady across the street. She gets across the street safely and, you know, you thank her. You, you know, I mean, you, you help her to her feet. She thanks you. And then somebody else comes up who didn't help her and says, I helped you across the street. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> whoo, yeah. So that's going to make somebody feel a certain kind of way, but it's more than that. It's the fact that you're taking an idol, you're taking this, this thing that you made with your hands that has nothing. It doesn't see, it can't speak, it can't breathe, it can't walk, it can't move. So how did it lead your dumb butt out of anywhere? You know, so it's just, it, it's just that. So God got really like after, so then, and even after that, God still tried with them. Um, and they just they just wouldn't stop so at one point in the bible god is like or one time i should say in that history god is like i'm i'm done i'm done just i'm done with them so i feel like when you look at the behavior of having a lot of idol worship and all that stuff and you compare the behaviors I feel like the the indigenous people in South and Central America followed Jeroboam. I feel like that's Jeroboam. I feel like the ones uh, in the North are not. I don't know what family they're coming from. I do believe they are from the tribe of Judah though. That is one thing I do believe. I believe they are from the tribe of Judah. Something that I was speaking about in one of my interviews. I have an interview tonight on Facebook Live. If you want to see it, uh, follow me on on uh, on Facebook. You can look up ESP Presents, uh, and that's where who's going to be hosting it uh, on Facebook. And you should see my live there. If you look up ESP Presents, her name, the lady, the host's name is Ellen. Um. The the there's just so much when you when you you listen to this and it's just there's a it's it's a lot but just get some tea relax sit back and enjoy. Um, I did not read it so that you can. <laughs> I didn't read it because there's a lot of words in there. I don't know how to properly pronounce because I've never heard them before, and um, I want them to be pronounced properly. So yeah, I apologize to anybody who does not like the. The um, it's a dubbed over. It's a human voice just dubbed over. The computer just they dubbed it basically. But it it is a person. This is an actual real person that's reading this. Um, it's just that their voice has been dubbed over. 
anyway. <clears throat> so I hope you enjoy. And I am going to add images in there just for visual, you know, just for creativity, just for, just to have something to look at. Um, and I hope that you enjoy. I will see you in the uh, talk, speak to you in the next video. Talk to you later. In the preceding chapter, it is stated that the fine arts will be used as strong evidences towards the development of this epoch and that they will be received as records. They represent what will be wanted in illustrating the Aborigines of the North Viz. The Lex Scripta for sculpture and paintings must be regarded only as a more concise and impressive manner of writing. Since, therefore, sculpture is one of the powers conjoined with architecture to enable us to raise our historical edifice. It is necessary to prove the existence of our strength in the country illustrated to prove that ancient cities have been discovered, that temples and palaces have been recovered from the depths of the forest, and that, too, in that part of America now under consideration, having reference to the Aborigines not of the North. These investigations are required for the reader who may not have read the incidents of travel in Central America and even those that have, will expect an analysis or review of the discovered ruins. It is also demanded by the character of this work, for it is essential to establish their existence before they can be produced as witnesses to support an historic argument. And like a legal document, parole evidence will not be received if the document itself can be produced. Paintings also are a portion of the evidence to sustain our novel history. The paintings of Mexican America, though rude, contain proofs of progressive ages, whereby facts may be gathered, supported by traditions, to authorize the formation of a chronological arrangement of events. These pictorial efforts of art are on cloth of unusual thickness. In order to secure stability for the Mexicans had no other written records but to which may now be added from the late discoveries sculpture. The paintings, it has been stated, were rude and not unlike those of ancient Egypt. And like those of the Nile, a symbol stood for whole sentences or parts of history and does not the same method exist with European art. A cross represents the crucifixion. It is in this manner that the paintings of ancient Mexico must be translated. The colouring was far beyond the Egyptian in regard to brilliancy and variety, an important point in proving a Tyrian analogy. The Spaniards, at their conquest of Mexico, burnt in the public marketplace pyramids of paintings, the designs of which are even lost to history. Yet many others were subsequently preserved and now adorn the royal libraries of Bologna, Madrid, and the Vatican. The National Library of England contains a vellum folio copy of the splendid work by Lord Kingsborough upon these paintings, forming, in the seven volumes, a collection of all the pictorial relics of ancient Mexico. The skill of the Mexican painters was extended to another branch of writing, in which nautical science claimed a share maps and shots. This important fact will be enlarged upon in the analogies. These few remarks are only inserted in order to sustain a consecutive arrangement of evidence, for the reader must already have known of the existence of these paintings, though not of their novel application. The several discoveries of the ruined cities will now be reviewed and established. In the ancient capital of the Mexican Empire, it has been stated, that the Spaniards acted the character of incendiaries. In 1520, every available specimen of Mexican art was consumed by Cortes and the priests. Paintings, the only manuscripts of the Mexican nation, were destroyed and became a bonfire for the soldiery. Every palace and temple of the capital was leveled to the earth and the foundation of the first cathedral of the invaders was laid with thousands of statues, the idols of the Aborigines. Every vestige of the Mexican records was supposed to have been consumed, broken, or buried. 
After a lapse of 270 years, two statues were dug up in the grand plaza of the modern city of Mexico. But from the interest felt for these religious relics by the Poe descendants of the Aborigines, the Spaniards secretly buried them, it was said, in the garden court of a convent. At the same time, 1790, was exhumed a circular piece of sculpture having reference to the astronomical calendar of the ancient inhabitants. This is still preserved in Mexico and is quoted and a drawing given by the illustrious Humboldt in his work upon that country. It will be referred to in the analogies. A brief review of the discovery of the ruins and their locality will now be required. From a record by Juarez of Guatemala and that on the authority of Fuentes, the ruins of Copan were known in 1700. Palenque was visited by Del Rio and by Dupe about 1805. In the beginning of the 19th century, the scientific Humboldt visited Mexico. He obtained drawings of the ruins of Mitla in the province of Oaxaca and others of a similar character, but especially the terrace pyramid of Colula, which he visited. The investigations were published by the same scholastic traveller. At a later period, Uxmal, Yucatan, was explored under a commission of the Spanish government by Waldeck. His work, Folio, is most beautifully illustrated. In compliment to the nobleman who published the great work on the ancient Mexican paintings, he called one of the ruins, the Pyramid of Kingsborough, an anachronism, perhaps, allowable when the motive is considered. Copan was visited by Galindo in 1836, but he lacked the perseverance necessary for a perfect exploration. This latter desideratum was fully evinced by Stevens and Catherwood who, in 1839-40, visited and explored all of the above, excepting those seen by Baron Humboldt, and several cities before unknown in general history. As a geographical position, the localities of these dead cities are between the capital of Mexico and the Isthmus of Darien, but chiefly in Guatemala, on the borders of Yucatan, and on that peninsula. They therefore occupy the narrow part of the river Montagua empties itself into the Bay of Honduras at or near Omoa. Approaching the source of this river, it branches off to the south which branch is called Copan River. Above the rapids of this branch river is situated on the banks the now celebrated ruined city of Copan, over two miles in extant, parallel with the stream. Palenque is nearer Mexico, the ruins of Uxmal are in Yucatan. From the architectural characteristics of the edifices, we find no difficulty in arranging the order of their being built, which, with all due respect for the opinion of others, we submit to be as follows. Viz. First, the city of Copan, then Coyula, followed by Quirigua, Tecpanguatimola, Quiche, Gegetinango, Ocosingo, Mitla, Palenque, and lastly, Uxmal. And about the same period of building, the cities of Shaichen, Sei, Coba, Espita, and Tikal, these last being in the peninsula of Yucatan. Compared with these relics of past centuries, we consider the city of Mexico to be of comparatively modern date. At the time of the Spanish conquest, a. d. 1520, the ruins necessary to be described for the illustration of our present subject will be those of Copan, Palenque, and Uxmal and for this purpose extracts will be quoted from the lately published work on Central America by Mr. Stevens. These extracts will be given as unquestionable authority, and the engravings in the work will be received as accurate representation of the ruins and upon which many of our results have been founded. On the subject of their accuracy, the fascinating traveller writes as follows, I will only remark, that from the beginning our great object and effort was to procure true copies of the originals, adding nothing for effect as pictures. Mr. 
Catherwood made the outline of all the drawings with the camera lucida and divided his paper into sections so as to preserve the utmost accuracy of proportion. The engravings were made with the same regard to truth, from drawings reduced by Mr. C., himself the originals being also in the hands of the engraver. Proofs of every plate were given to Mr. C., who made such corrections as were necessary, and in my opinion they are as true copies as can be presented and except the stones themselves the reader cannot have better materials for speculation and study. Though this candid traveller acknowledges not to know the principles of architecture or the rules of art, and when in Egypt amused himself by mutilating a statue of Isis, one, yet when he came in sight of buried cities in his own country, before unknown to the history of the world, the sculpture of which is as fine as that of Egypt, feelings he must have had of which no man would rob him, reputation by being the explorer, of which an enemy would not attempt to deprive him, and although we are not selfish enough to covet his reputation, yet we are candid enough to admit that we have, from the heart, envied him his feelings. He has given indeed by his pen, and the artist by his pencil, a reflection of the ruins, but it is from a mirror of polished ebony simply a facsimile resemblance, light and shade only, a specimen of daguerreotype. No one can mistake the rapid manner in which the true copy is impressed upon the mind, and that by the most easy and agreeable means viz. the fascination of his style. But the colouring of life is not there, the soul of history is wanting. The Promethean spark by which the flame of historic truth should illuminate his work and be viewed as a gleaming beacon from afar to direct wanderers through the dark night of wonders has found no spot to rest upon and to vivify. But this he has done. He has brought the timbers of the historic bark to view. Research must build and science place the rudder. The pilot, constant as the northern star, Enthusiasm must drive her before the wind. Every sail set, fore and aft, aloft, abroad and full, and it will be strange indeed if that spark will not be found upon truth's phosphoric sea. If these ruins can be identified with a nation of the ancient world, ancient world, the first word is superfluous now, for these discoveries have destroyed the opposite phrase, new world. That expression will belong hereafter to England and parts of Europe, not America. For the former date from the first Tsar, the latter, if we are not, from an older and a greater conqueror. If, we say, these ruins can be identified with a country of Asia and of the olden time, we shall have no regret for having turned shipwright to aid the discovery of that nation. And if our classic galley should founder ere we reach the point proposed, we shall at least struggle in the buoyant waves of hope and pleasure, our light heart floating above the waters of disappointment. And with joyous pride will we hail those who in passing by have found and steered a truer track. First will be given a description of such parts of the great ruins as may be necessary in the author's own words, with such commentaries as may be required by the narration. Then will follow Mr. Stevens's reflections upon all the ruins. His arguments will be met, his errors detected, his contradictions investigated, and thereupon we shall endeavor, at least, to completely refute his deductions and conclusions. The ruins of Copen, they are in the district of country now known as the state of Honduras, one of the most fertile valleys of Central America. Their precise locality was stated in the last section, with the exception that their distance from the sea is about 300 miles. The Copen River is not navigable, even for canoes, except for a short distance in the rainy season. This is a description of the river now, 1843, and not as it may have appeared at the time of erecting the edifices. Falls intercept its course before it empties into the Montagua. As a principle of military defense, the site was well chosen, 
for the barrier of the falls would prevent the approach of an enemy to the sitter by the river from the Atlantic. The extent of the ruins along the river, as ascertained by monuments still found, is more than two miles. There is one monument, or ruin, on the opposite side of the river, at the distance of a mile, on the top of a mountain 2,000 feet high. Whether the city ever crossed the river and extended to that monument, it is impossible to say. I believe not, so do we. And that belief instructs us in the seeming fact of another means of military defense. For from the locality and height of the mountain it is almost evident that the monument was used as a watchtower, and consequently from that elevated point a complete view was obtained of all the approaches to the city. These facts illustrate, seemingly at least, that the Aborigines had a knowledge of military security as well as that of architecture, and as we believe that Copen was the first sitter built in the Western Hemisphere, these considerations will be of importance in identifying. The reader will understand, once for all, that no hint, even the most remote, is derived from Mr. Stevens's work, or any other, towards the formation of our theory, or the establishing of this epoch. On the contrary, he distinctly asserts, Vol. IIP 442, I shall not attempt to inquire into the origin of this people, from what country they came, or when, or how. I shall confine myself to their works and their ruins, our artistical or historical comments, good, bad, or indifferent, are our own, and accompany the quotations for the purpose of supporting the analogies in a subsequent chapter. The italicized and bracketed words the reader will give us special attention to, as we have so expressed them for facility in illustrating. There are no remains in Copen of palaces or private dwellings, and the principal part of the ruins is that which stands on the bank of the river and may perhaps with propriety be called the temple. The temple is an oblong enclosure. The front or river wall stone and nearly 100 feet high, volume I, p. 95, extends on a right line, north and south, 624 feet, and it is from 60 to 90 feet in height, the difference in height arising from several parts having fallen. It, the river wall, is made of cut stone, from 3 to 6 feet in length, and a foot and a half in breadth. In many places the stones have been thrown down by bushes growing out of the crevices. The other three sides consist of ranges of steps and pyramidal structures, rising from 30 to 140 feet on a slope. The whole line of survey of this temple is 2,866 feet, which though gigantic and extraordinary for a ruined structure of the Aborigines, that the reader's imagination may not mislead him, I consider it necessary to say, is not so large as the great Egyptian pyramid of Gizeh. We certainly do not desire to be misled, or our readers either, therefore, at once, will be compared the measurements of the Pyro Temple of Copan and the Pyramid of Egypt. Lee Bryan gives the base side of the great edifice of the Nile at 750 feet. Greve states it to be 693 feet. The difference between these computations is 57 feet, which divided for an average and added to the lesser sum will show one side to be 721 feet and the fraction, which multiplied by four, the sum total of the entire square base will be 2,884 feet, that of Copen viz. 2,866 feet, will leave only a difference between the great pyramidal edifices in Egypt and Copen of 18 feet. But from diversity in measurement they may be viewed as the facsimiles of each other in regard to the base. This cannot be accidental. Taking Greaves's numbers, each side 693 multiplied by 4 equal 2,772 feet. 
Stevens's sum total of Copen is 2,866, leaving an increase in size over that of the Egyptian of 94 feet. Mr. Stevens may, perhaps, have forgotten the measurements in Egypt, although he has travelled there, but we shall have occasion to refer to the ingenious manner in which he endeavours to stay the imagination of his readers upon the subject of all the ruins. The comparative measurements have been brought forward, that the reader may not be misled in reading this work. Another singular coincidence, we may remark, occurs in the measurement of the terrace pyramid at Mexican Colula. The base of that is 5,760 feet. Now the base of the Egyptian, as shown above, is 2,884 feet only. This sum multiplied by two produces a sum total of 5,768. A difference only of eight feet would make the pyramid of Colula exactly twice as large as that of Egypt. An error may have occurred in reference to the eight feet for in so large a measurement, and by different authors, it is but natural that an error might arise, and consequently these bases, as to size, cannot be viewed as accidental. Near the southwest corner of the river wall, and the south wall, is a recess, which was probably once occupied by a colossal monument fronting the water no part of which is now visible. Beyond are the remains of two small pyramidal structures, to the largest of which is attached a wall running along the west bank of the river. This appears to have been one of the principal walls of the city, and between the two pyramids there seems to have been a gateway or principal entrance from the water. The south wall runs at right angles to the river, beginning with a range of steps about 30 feet high, and each step about 18 inches square. At the southeast corner is a massive pyramidal structure 120 feet high on the slope. On the right are other remains of terraces and pyramidal buildings, and here, also, was probably a gateway, by a passage about 20 feet wide, into a quadrangular area 250 feet square, two sides of which are massive pyramids 120 feet on the slope. At the foot of these structures, and at different parts of the quadrangular area, are numerous remains of sculpture, especially a colossal monument, richly sculptured, fallen and ruined. Behind it fragments of sculpture, thrown down from their places by trees, are strewed and lying loose on the side of the pyramid, from the base to the top. Idols give a peculiar character to the ruins of Copen. One stands with its face to the east eye, east to the rising sun, about six feet from the base of the pyramidal wall. It is thirteen feet high, four feet in front and back, and three feet on the side's eye. East four-sided column, sculptured on all four of its sides, from the base to the top, and one of the richest and most elaborate specimens in the whole extent of ruins. Originally, it was painted, the marks of red color being distinctly visible. Before it, at the distance of about eight feet, is a large block of sculptured stone, which the Indians call an altar. The subject of the front eye, east of the idol obelisk, is a full-length figure, the face wanting beard, and of a feminine cast, though the dress seems that of a man. On the two sides are rows of hieroglyphics eye. East the sacred or religious language, which probably recite the history of this mysterious personage. Following the wall is another monument or idol of the same size, and in many respects similar. The character of this image as it stands at the foot of the pyramidal structure, with masses of fallen stone, ruins, resting against its base, is grand and it would be difficult to exceed the richness of the ornament and sharpness of the sculpture. This, too, was painted, and the red is still distinctly visible. The whole quadrangle is overgrown with trees, and interspersed with fragments of fine sculpture, particularly on the east side eye, east to the rising sun. At the northeast corner is a narrow passage, 
which was probably a third gateway. On the right is a confused range of terraces running off into the forest. Turning northward, the range to the left hand continues a high massive pyramidal structure, with trees growing out of it to the very top. At a short distance is a detached pyramid about 50 feet square and 30 feet high. The range of structures turns at right angles to the left and runs to the river, joining the other extremity of the wall at which we began our survey. The bank was elevated about 30 feet above the river and had been protected by a wall of stone, most of which had fallen down. The sitter wall on the riverside, with its raised bank, and making allowances for what had fallen from the top of the great wall, must then have ranged from 130 to 150 feet in height. There was no entire pyramid, but at most two or three pyramidal sides, and then joined on to terraces or other structures of the same kind. The first line of this last quotation is distinctly contradicted a few lines before it, for he says, at a short distance is a detached pyramid about 50 feet square. Therefore this is an entire pyramid. That of Colula stands solitary and alone in a large plain, and there, at least, is an entire pyramid, so far as its base and sides are considered. Beyond the wall of enclosure were walls, terraces, and pyramidal elevations running off into the forest, which sometimes confused us. Probably the whole was not erected at the same time, but additions were made, and statues erected by different kings, or perhaps in commemoration of important events in the history of the city. Along the whole line were ranges of steps with pyramidal elevations, probably crowned on the top with buildings or altars, now in ruins. All these steps and the pyramidal sides were painted, red, and the reader may imagine the effect when the whole country was clear of forest, and priests and people were ascending from the outside of the terraces, and thence to the holy places within to pay their adoration in the temple. Within this enclosure are two rectangular courtyards, having ranges of steps ascending to terraces. The area of each is about 40 feet from the river. On one side at the foot of the pyramidal wall is another monument or idol, I, East Sculptured Obelisk. It is about the same height as the others, in all fourteen, but differs in shape, being larger at top than below. Its appearance and character are tasteful and pleasing. We desire to call the particular attention of the reader to the following piece of sculpture as it will hold a conspicuous position as we advance in this volume. Near this, idol last mentioned, is a remarkable altar, which perhaps presents as curious a subject for speculation as any monument at Copen. The altars, like the idols, are all of a single block of stone. In general, they are not so richly ornamented, and are more faded and worn, or covered with moss. All deferred in fashion, and doubtless had some distinct and peculiar reference to the idols before which they stood. Each of the idols, therefore, had an altar before it, and each of the altars had its relative idol, except the one about to be described. This altar stands on four globes, cut out of the same stone. The sculpt sure is in bas-relief, and it is the only specimen of that kind of sculpture found at Copen all the rest being in bold alto relievo. By a reference to the map for its locality, we find that it is situated nearly in the very center of the vast temple. This, together with its being alone, unassociated with an idol, the sculpture being entirely different, and the only specimen found there, all the others being in alto, but this in basso, a proof of its greater antiquity. The very stone seems to find a voice to proclaim that it was the chief altar of Copen. It may be a curious subject, but certainly does not require much speculation to form a conclusion. The description of the detail of the sculpture seems to furnish another reason for believing it to be the principal altar. It is six feet square and four feet high, 
and the top is divided into 36 tablets, or squares, of hieroglyphics, which beyond doubt record some event in the history of the mysterious people who once inhabited the city. This we distinctly believe, and that the sculpt sure about to be described translates the hieroglyphics, and those being translated, the event in the history is then arrived at. Whether we have accomplished this or not, the reader will judge as he proceeds, for we have looked upon this chief altar as the Rosetta Stone of the Ruins, the keystone in the Arch of Mystery. Each side of the altar represents four individuals. On the west side are the two principal personages, chiefs, or warriors, with their faces opposite to each other, and apparently engaged in argument or negotiation. The other fourteen figures are divided into two equal parties and seem to be following their leaders. Each of the two principal figures is seated cross-legged, in the oriental fashion, on an hieroglyphic which probably designated his name and office or character, and on two of which the serpent forms part. The description reads three. The engraving shows only two serpents. The later will be received as correct from the accuracy ascribed to the drawings by Mr. Stevens and already quoted. Between the two principal personages is a remarkable cartouche containing two hieroglyphics well preserved, which reminded us strongly of the Egyptian method of giving the names of the kings and heroes in whose honor monuments were erected. The head dresses are remarkable for their curious and complicated form. The figures have all breastplates, and one of the two principal characters holds in his hand an instrument, which perhaps may be considered a scepter. Each of the others holds an object, which can be only a subject for speculation and conjecture. We believe them to be, judging from the engravings, spiral shells. The application will be found in the important chapter devoted to the analogies. It, the object, may be a weapon of war, and if so, it is the only thing of the kind found at Copen. In other countries, battle scenes, warriors, and weapons of war are among the most prominent subjects of sculpture. And from the entire absence of them here, there is reason to believe that the people were not warlike, but peaceable and easily subdued. Are not the sculptures, the idols, and altars, the ornaments of a temple, and as a consequence, should be devoid of the weapons of war? A false conclusion is arrived at by Mr. Stevens when, from the absence of battle axes, shields, and helms in a religious temple, it must follow as a necessity that those worshipping there must be devoid of courage. Our own altars might be so regarded if his reasoning was admitted, yet few persons would have the temerity to say, because the Christian altars are devoid of warlike weapons, that the Anglo-Saxon race are easily subdued. The hands that built those temples on the western continent could also defend them. The military position and strength of Copen prove the builders to be of a race far from cowards and not easily to be conquered. In these remarks we would not confound the previous distinction drawn between the courage of these aborigines and those of the north. The Mexicans were courageous in quick assault but had not the indomitable endurance and persevering fortitude of the Northerns. Enough has been quoted concerning the ruins of Copen. Yet it should be stated that among those ruins was found a sculptured tortoise. This will be referred to in the analogies. As a summary of the ruins of Copen, they are of sculptured stone, with the absence of stucco, but pyramidal structures and bases, no circular columns, but square or four-sided obelisks, or idols, sculptured altars, flights of steps forming pyramidal slopes, but only on three sides, excepting in one instance, and all these bearing distinct testimony of having been painted or dyed with a red color, a perpendicular wall nearly 100 feet in height, and the sculpture is not only rich in detail, 
but finely executed. At Copen there is no vestige of wooden beams or lintels in or about the ruins, and no appearance of a roof of any description. The arch is nowhere found, or anything indicating that its principle was known to the Copanians. The absence of all metal is another singular feature. The quarry from whence the stone was taken is about two miles distant from the temple, and the supposition of Mr. Stephen seems probable viz. that from the discovery of flint stone and of the hardest description, the softer stone composing the altars and idols was cut with this flint in lieu of metal. Everything seems to denote the great antiquity of these ruins over those of any of the other cities, for it will be shown that they had a knowledge of the use of metal and that they had found it. At Okosingo there is a wooden beam, and at Palenque, and at Uxmal, all the lintels of the doors are of wood, and so hard is its character that a sharp knife will turn its edge upon it, as if drawn vertically upon a bar of rough steel or iron. Therefore from the facts contained in this summary, together with the event in the history of the chief altar, and yet to be given, we have placed Copen as the most ancient, and, as far as discovered, the first architectural sitter built on the western continent. There is one description at Copen which will be reserved for the purpose of refuting, in the subsequent pages, one of Mr. Stevens's conclusions, as expressed in his reflections upon the collective ruins of these cities, whose antiquity, in the language of the prophet, is of ancient days.